From New York City, for our viewers worldwide, very good morning. I'm Manus Cranny in for Jonathan Ferrer. We have a new narrative from Nouriel Roubini of no landing. What does that mean to the rates, market and equities? We discuss over the next 60 minutes. A dip at the open. We're counting down. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up in the show, the equity rally taking a breather after a series of record highs. Chairman Powell heads to Capitol Hill ahead of the payroll report. And the EU slams Apple with a massive $2 billion antitrust fine. We begin with the big issue of the day. Investors bracing for a monster week ahead. The next data point obviously is, well, first of all, of course, Jay Powell on Wednesday. Then we have on Friday in unfound farm payrolls where my Bloomberg screen tells me 200,000 jobs in the month of February. That's not yep. bad. That's not a slowdown. So it really does boil down to that we are simply not slowing down. Where is the slowdown that we all had expected for so long, including myself and the consensus and the Fed? Let's preview the week ahead. Mike McKee is with me side by side. It's going to be a monster week. Mike, good morning. Good morning, and it is going to be led by Jay Powell, who goes up to Capitol Hill to testify before the House on Wednesday, the Senate on Thursday. He's not really a PowerPoint guy, but if he were, this is the chart he would show. This is both CPI and PCE inflation, the two big measures. And you can see over on the right-hand side the story they tell. The Fed has more work to do, and that's probably going to be the heart of his message. We're in no hurry to cut interest rates, which is kind of not what they're going to want to hear up on Capitol Hill, at least not the Democrats. It's almost Shakespeare. And go back to Macbeth. And if it were done when it is done, then twer well, it were done quickly. Nope. <laughs> Not from the Fed. Uh, Sherrod Brown, who chairs the Senate Banking Committee, uh, quoted earlier this year in a letter he wrote to the Fed urging them to ease monetary policy early this year. Just a week ago, Donald Trump was out saying he thinks that. The Fed is going to do something to help Democrats if they lower interest rates this year. So going to be a lot of questions about uh, whether the Fed is not only going to move, but what their motivation is if they do. So uh, we'll watch for that. And then other plot lines. Powell is testifying ahead of the State of the Union, remember. So a lot of politics up on the Hill this week. They'll be asking him about the budget deficit. Whose fault is it? Republicans say Democrats. Democrats say Republicans. He'll try to stay out of that. New banking regulation and capital requirements. This is a bet noir for Republicans on both the Banking and uh, Finance Committee. The Fed is looking at new regulations that would raise capital requirements. And that is something that they are going to be uh, uh, well, Republicans probably attacking him about and the Elizabeth Warren camp praising him for. And then, of course, everybody wants to know about the balance sheet rundown, and the politicians will probably question him about why the Fed is losing money on all this. So a lot for Jay Powell to talk about, perhaps more than usual, with this whole idea of when does the Fed cut rates and why would they do that hanging out there. Okay, Mike. Good to bring a bit of Shakespeare in on a Monday morning. Michael McKee setting the agenda for the week. Let's start the conversation with State Street's Laurie Heinel and PGM's Greg Peters. Good morning. The issue is this. We've even got Nouriel Rabini coming into the studio saying no landing. I mean, for a Parmabara, that's quite, that's quite a statement. So, Laurie, let me begin it with you. Does Powell double down on this no rush to cut and are you in the no landing camp? Well, first of all, I think Powell does double down on the no rush to cut because he's not going to want to be seen as being influenced by any particular data point. Having said that, we believe that the Fed is already a bit behind the curve. In fact, we're thinking that they should start cutting, if not in March, certainly by June. And part of that is that despite the fact that the U.S. seems incredibly resilient, there are signs of weakness that are starting to emerge. And beyond that, we don't think that a 5-plus percent interest rate is consistent with an economy that's likely to be growing closer to trend. Well, Let's, let's take this argument a little bit further. The last time we heard from Jay Powell was on 60 Minutes, and this is what he said. The danger of moving too soon is that the job's not quite done. And that's really 
good readings that we've had over the last six months somehow turn out not to be true, an indicator of, infl of where inflation is heading. Now, Peter, of course, if, if we bring that across to you, I'm oh, sorry, Greg, if we bring that to you, we've had CPI, PPI and a PCE, which is slightly above trend. So, Laurie, I get your point, which is they're behind the curve, but the evidence gives them cover, doesn't, doesn't it, Greg? Spot on. I mean, I don't understand the obsession with what Powell uh, is going to say. It doesn't matter what he's going to say. He's going to follow the data. And what is not being talked about nearly enough is market expectations for inflation have increased pretty substantially, right? So if you look at one-year inflation break-evens, they're double where they were last year. So they're 4%. Uh, two years at just called 3%. So inflation per the market is moving the other way. So Focusing on Powell and how he tries to finesse it, I think, misses the central picture, which is what is the data telling you? What is the market telling you? And uh, everything else is just white noise in my mind. <laughs> it's always good when you get a guest to come on the show and go, it just doesn't matter what Jay Powell says uh, this week. That's why we have you on. But then that takes us very naturally to the Torsten Slot narrative, which is the risk of, Greg, no cuts 2024. Let's pit the two of you head to head here, Laurie. Um, if you say it doesn't matter and that the data and the break evens are breaking higher, therefore you will come into the camp of three cuts or less. So again, we're still in the camp that the Fed is behind the eight ball. And part of the challenge is that they were behind the eight ball when they started to fight inflation. So they're going to be even more measured when they start to cut, in part because they maybe learned their lesson a bit. And I don't think that it's it doesn't matter. There's a lot of room between where we are now and where we were before we went into this rate hiking cycle. So again, our view is that when you have long-term growth expectations anchored somewhere around 2% here in the US, and you don't have inflation that warrants a rate of five or five and a half percent, then there does there's a lot of room there for the Fed to make some adjustments. And I think the other thing that we're starting to see is that there's a lot of vulnerability. Corporate profits continue to hold up in here, but as you continue to see some of this repricing factor into the market, that will be more pressure on companies to be able to deliver against a backdrop where they're still absorbing a lot of this tight policy. So, Greg, if you are looking at the break-evens, and that's just one portion of the narrative I know that, you, that you're looking at, um, do you fall into the camp, then, that you could see where Torsten Schlock is going, is that there is a case for no rate cuts this year. If the break-evens are moving higher, if the narrative is that inflation is not as under control, well, it, it, it's steady, but it's just not slicing down to 2%. So does that build on the argument that you could have three or less rate cuts this year? Yeah, so our base case have been all along 50 to 75 basis points of cuts, so modulating rates lower. But I think what is highlighted by what Torsen's saying is that the market continues to lean really the other way, right? So the bias in this marketplace is much more dramatic rate cuts, right? And you saw where we were at the beginning of the year. You see it when any kind of swoon in the marketplace, the market instantaneously prices in a dramatic rate cut environment. And that just doesn't hold in our estimation, given where inflation is, given where growth is. So I think what Torsten is really just highlighting is that the risk in the market is that they don't cut at all, because the market has continued to lean into this notion that uh, you will see rate cuts in even more than 50 to 75 basis points. So that's the bias. How much of a risk, Greg, then would that be to the bond market? Tens trade at 422 this morning, given the narrative that we've just discussed, would that be materially disruptive to rates? Would it be 4.5%? Would it be 5%? And would you be a natural buyer on those riff higher? Yeah, so I think it pushes everything uh, higher for sure. So if you don't see rate cuts coming in, the front end will continue to adjust uh, higher, which will move the entire curve higher. Uh, but you'll still continue to have this inverted curve, um, uh, at least as, uh, you know, tens, uh, Two's tens and two's thirties. Uh, so the market will continue to kind of have this inversion being priced in, which is to say they're not really buying into the notion that, uh, you know, we won't have rate cuts at all. So uh, I do think there's a repricing. I think it'll be a gentle repricing, uh, uh, but it's really about what the data uh, uh, says behind it. So 
If, if I look at the, the whole narrative, Laurie, over the past couple of days, Goldman Sachs have been with us, a number of other houses have been with us, putting out their new notes, 5,500, 5,400. I look at Bank of America uh, this morning again, coming in with 5,400, and Subramaniam writing this. Bull markets end with euphoria. We're not there yet. Sentiment has improved, but there are areas of euphoria are limited. If you think that the Fed goes earlier, perhaps, than, than, than uh, Greg does, um, would you think that that's supportive to the equity market narrative? And would you agree that we are not in some kind of euphoric, distended level uh, of excitement in these equity markets? Well, from an overall equity market standpoint, we're not in that euphoria distended period. There certainly are stocks that we think are at nosebleed territory and they just keep plumbing higher highs. So it's hard to know when that will end. But there is a lot of opportunity for the market to broaden out. We started to see that earlier this year as we saw more participation in things like the value factor and the quality factor and other elements that are uh, potentially there to drive the markets higher. But I think it's important to keep in mind that part of what will dictate markets over the balance of the year is what's the backdrop, not just what the Fed does, but why do they do it? So if we're right that economic activity is likely to continue to slow, uh, and against that backdrop, the Fed is starting to ease policy, then you could have a market that stagnates a bit or perhaps even mm -hmm. corrects a bit because there's this recognition finally that things aren't going to go on forever and there are market, market cycles still. Greg, what would this scenario do to credit? I look at triple B to double B. You know, those are incredibly uh, whip thin. You know, they're razor thin spreads in credit at the moment uh, be between the areas. Given the scenario you've outlined this morning, do you think there's any pinch points in credit? Yeah, so I do think higher rates all else equal puts pressure on over levered uh, capital structures. It just takes time, right? Because there has been this debt uh, term out trade over the past several years. So the longer that these higher rates persist, the more stress and strain you'll see uh, lower down the scale. Uh, so we continue to see real opportunities in uh, investment grade corporates. So investment grade corporates last week really sold off uh, pretty meaningfully based on supply. But I think that misses the story for the balance of the year. So we've seen unreal net supply hit this quarter. But after that, it really turned severely the other way. And there's such a demand for credit that I think the trade for the balance of this year is high quality credit as a result. Well, certainly we've seen the floodgates open on the supply side. Uh, Greg, thank you very much. Stay with me. Laurie Heinel, Greg Peters, my guest, kicking off this Monday morning uh, for a pretty big, big on pretty, pretty big week on risk. I can get my words out. It's Monday morning. Uh, stocks are moving ahead of the opening bell. Lots of flow and news. Uh, Abigail is with me. Indeed, Manis. And we do have the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq slightly lower at this point. Those futures being weighed on in part by Tesla. Shares down more than 1% this after shipments from China fell to the lowest level in about a year. Uh, they shipped just over 60,000 vehicles, down 16% month over month. Investors truly not liking that. On the other hand, super microcomputer, this is amazing, a 15.5% the stock being added to the S&P 500. So managers will have to index to it, or at least those index managers will be forced to buy it. Into today, over the last year, up an eye-popping 821%. Really pretty incredible. And then Coinbase up 6% uh, in line, uh, being helped out by Bitcoin higher. And then, of course, last hour, we did have that breaking news around uh, JetBlue and Spirit Airlines. JetBlue is letting go of that $3.8 billion bid, troubled by lots of regulatory factors. Spirit plunging even more on this, down 14%. But JetBlue Airway uh, investors, they are clearly happy, relieved, up 5.3%, Manus. Yep, they are and they've been given a little bit more guidance. Abby will dig into that story shortly. Abigail Doolittle, as ever, side by side on the stocks and sectors. Coming up on the show, the U.S. consumer in the spotlight. The entire department store sector has been under pressure pretty much since 9-11. Retail earnings continue rolling out throughout the week. The conversation continues on Bloomberg. department store sector has been under pressure pretty much since 9-11. Um, it kind of peaked around the year, you know, 2000, 2001, and has been just on a downward trajectory since then. 
The US consumer confidence falls for the first time in four months. That was in February. Optimism on financial conditions fades. Will we get clearer picture this week? Thanks to a number of those retail earnings target. Ross stores both report tomorrow. Foot Locker on Wednesday and the week rounds out on Thursday. Costco and Gap joining me now to put context around the US consumer. Simone Foxman. Simone, what have we got? Yeah, Mattis, we could see the divergence between those retail winners and retail losers really on display this week as investors try and parse all these earnings calls for signs about the health of the consumer, whether or not uh, they are weakening. On the discount, we are expecting a lot of those big discount names to really show some same store sales gains. Burlington same store sales, for example, could be up as high as 11% year on year. Costco, uh, the street is looking for about a 7% uh, rise in same store sales. At the same time, though, everyone's expecting to see a bunch of weakness on those consumer brand names, the likes of Target down 4.6% uh, consumer sales expectation. Foot Locker could be down as much as 7%. Um, so that real divergence expected to be on display. And this, in the past quarters, is re what's really dri driven a lot of the uh, confusion around exactly how healthy this consumer is. Also, watch out for mentions of shrink that has taken a toll on some shares uh, over past uh, quarters as well. All of this, however, coming in the backdrop of uh, maybe a rise in M&A, especially related to Macy's. Over the weekend, we saw Brigade and Arc House boost their offer by 14% to buy all the shares of Macy's they don't already own. Uh, their offer at $24 a share. Now it would put the value of that company at $6.6 billion. Macy's, of course, rejected an earlier offer, saying it didn't provide compelling value. We will see if this offer is enough to change your minds, Menace. Okay, uh, certainly a kicker there, up 15.38%. Simone Foxman with us there on the retail front. And we will get more information, break those uh, throughout the week with you. My guests this morning are Laurie Hanel and Greg Peters. Greg, I want to bring it to you from the context, from the macro context. I look at the savings rate uh, during the pandemic. It blew out by 30%. That's gone. We're now down to a savings rate of 4.6%. We are at an inflection point in the consumer and I just wonder how much if at all do you extrapolate the dip in confidence in February with this dissipation in savings it's almost as if we're about to turn over the hill uh, in terms of the momentum for the consumer translate that for me yeah, so I think first and foremost the consumer confidence data is really quite um, let's use the word squirrely of late and so there's been some data issues there so I would put that to the side but, uh, you know, the consumer uh, is fragile, for sure. Uh, they have blown through their savings. That is something that we're uh, focused on. But there's other two, there's two other items that I think are important. Uh, first is on the wage front. So you're finally seeing real wages uh, improve uh, across a broad swath of uh, labor in ways that we haven't seen in quite some time. So I think that is a positive. Uh, and, uh, and the, uh, you know, second is higher interest rates on just their savings accounts, right? So I think those two items are, are new entrants into, you know, consumers' uh, psyche, and I do think that matters. But at the same time, I have to admit, it is fragile. It bears watching, no pun intended, uh, but, uh, but we're hopeful on that front. Laurie. Do you, do you share the, the, the sort of the, the question mark beside the consumer? It's interesting, Greg, obviously talking about the, the, the interest that we're receiving. But I would say back to you, Greg, on the other side of that trade, which is look at the blowout in, in sort of credit card spending by the consumer. Laurie, you're a post to the question mark against the U.S. consumer. Yeah, we think that the U.S. consumer is showing a lot of weakness in here, and we've been pretty much underweight, both staples and a lot of the discretionary spaces, in part because of that weakness in the part of the consumer. And then you add to that some of the sort of natural things that would buoy consumer spending, like household formation, you know, home sales, things of that nature, and we just don't think that there's a lot of value to be had there. The one place that we do still see some opportunity is in some of the luxury goods space where there's just less um, concern about that uh, cohort's ability to continue to spend in here. One global story, and actually it plays a little bit in, into the luxury sector, Laurie, that, that you mentioned is about China. We have this national convening growth rates, communication, policy responses to transmit to the Chinese economy. Laurie, from your perspective, um, how important is this week from a global growth perspective that China delivers? 
Well, certainly we all know the China story. It's pretty well telegraphed. China is slowing. They have vulnerabilities. They've got lots of issues, including the ongoing stresses in their real estate environment. And they'll continue to do things that at the margin can support their growth and can keep them from growing even more slowly than they already are, including uh, doubling down on exports, manufacturing, things of that nature, which actually does have a positive feedback loop in terms of exporting deflation to the rest of the globe. So it is critically important, but I think that the punchline is still that China has a lot of work to do ahead of it and fewer policy tools than it once had. And Greg, just to, to, to close off from the bond perspective, many people have said to me, uh, you know, everybody tailwinded the Fed on the way up, but it's other central banks, the UK, the ECB, uh, along with emerging markets, which are going to have to be more aggressive in their cuts. They're not going to be able to afford the same lat latitude of, of, of weight and hold briefly. How does that play into the narrative for rates? Yeah, so I think what you're seeing outside the U.S. is a lot less strength, for sure. Uh, you look at Europe, you look at China, you you know, even Japan is, uh, you know, going the other way. So so this is a decidedly a U.S. strength story as it currently stands. So when you think outside the U.S., uh, you do have to uh, envision uh, more aggressive uh, in terms of rate cuts. But there's also this pesky thing called inflation there, too. So, um, you know, that is a binding constraint for some uh, policymakers. But at the end of the day, we see this as a U.S. Uh, exceptionalism story. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it'll uh, bear fruit uh, via rates. It's a very consistent theme. Exceptionalism in terms of the dollar, exceptionalism in terms of the cross-asset allocation here to the United States relative to the rest of the world. Thank you so much for being with me, setting the stage. Laurie Heinel, Greg Peters, uh, on your risk map for this week ahead. Coming up, morning calls. And later, I will be joined by Bank of America's Jared Woodard. He joins me to make the case for stocks over bonds. That conversation still ahead on this, the opening bell. nervous on a week that you've got State of the Union, you've got Jay Powell, well, Laurie Heinle over at State Street just left us a message. The Fed will go early and probably go quite often. Uh, that is the moot in the markets. Let me get you up to speed with what the scribes are saying on Wall Street. RBC Capital Upgrades Lift to outperform, seeing the upside stemming from potential partnership with DoorDash. UBS upgrades Norfolk Southern to a buy, expecting strengthening in margins a better performance from its merchandise network. And finally, Goldman Sachs removes Apple from its conviction list of top buys, highlighting the stock's recent underperformance amid concerns of slumping demand. So we're going to catch up with Jared Woodward of, uh, Woodard of Bank of America Securities. The year of the bond, take two. We'll talk about credit, equity bonanza right now. Happy the Nasdaq there. Healthcare solutions from Truebridge. They're not just as uh, excited on equities at the moment. State Street say you'll get early cuts, fast and furious. Apple uh, is dragging us just a little bit lower. A $2 billion fine. That is the EU showing the teeth. We're rolling over to an opening. We're still above 5,100. Critically important psychological level. Uh, Ms. Subramaniam over at Bank of America says we are not in a euphoric state at the moment. Uh, and indeed, euphoria has yet to arrive in these equity markets. You may be euphoric in Bitcoin, above $65,000, up 4%. That's carrying through for some of the, uh, the overall platform providers in that space, the likes of Coinbase, Flying Higher, 10-year yields are up this morning. Again, there is this building narrative, Nuri Rabini with the team this morning on surveillance. No landing, no landing, less rate cuts, less rate cuts, higher yields. Does that make it appealing at 4.5% to step back in? That is the bond story on the Bloomberg today. Oil up four tenths of 1% as OPEC Plus extend their 2 million barrel a day cut through the second quarter. And Russia will step up to the plate in terms of doing their bit to sustain stabilization in the oil markets. Uh, to the retail market, Macy's at the open here. The shares are jumping, flying higher. Investors see increased takeover bid of 24 bucks a share. That is a 14% premium to the prior offer. Abigail Doolittle has the narrative. We're up 13%. 
We are up 13%. It's the best day for Macy's since uh, December of last year. And we've seen this story before because, of course, last year we did have Arc House and Brigade Capital Management come together uh, with an offer for Macy's, uh, which was rejected by Macy's, saying that it just didn't really unlock the value that they wanted to see. So now they have up that price. And to Friday's close, it represents a 14% or, excuse me, a 33% premium to Macy's Friday closing price right now. Uh, uh, nearly at $21. Now, they rejected that bid uh, in January. Excuse me, it wasn't last year. It was earlier this year, uh, saying that it lacked the compelling value. Uh, and then have instead, most recently on the earnings report, unveiled a restructuring that includes closing 150 uh, stores in the U.S. A lot of folks saying that their real estate is the most one of the more valuable pieces of their business. Macy's did confirm that they have received this proposal, and uh, they are saying that they will carefully and review and evaluate that offer. Again, the stock up 16%, the best day of the year. Macy's investors like it a lot, Manus. Go Macy's. Uh, Abby, thank you very much. Let's turn our attentions to the airline space. JetBlue formally abandoning its pursuit of Spirit Airlines. Uh, more than a month after a judge blocked the $3.8 billion acquisition. So it's doors to manual uh, at JetBlue, Simone. And it looks like the investors are cheering the stepping back by JetBlue. Yeah, they're certainly cheering JetBlue, but not so much Spirit Airlines this morning. There were serious doubts that this deal would arrive on time, despite the fact that both airlines had been fighting this ruling. But the deal was required to be completed by July. And this is something that JetBlue had noted back in January after that uh, judge's decision uh, and, and that it would violate antitrust laws, driving up prices, eliminating competition. Um, but the companies had really been vowing to fight this as recently as last week when they had asked for oral arguments uh, in their appeal to be in June. Um, but now we've seen ultimately this decision come. It's unclear if Carl Icahn uh, influenced the decision by a jet, on JetBlue's side. He recently got a pair of board seats after acquiring about 10% of the outstanding shares. JetBlue will pay Spirit $69 million in breakup fees. Um, but this is a real concern concern for Spirit, because it's not clear how the company is going to go ahead and finance its $1.5 billion of debt maturing this year. It said in a similar statement that it has retained Perella Weinberg as an advisor. Analysts believe that we could see a bankruptcy reorganization or even a liquidation of the deep discount carrier Bloomberg Intelligence uh, back uh, when the company reported earnings early February said that the end of this deal leaves uh, the airline with few options, Manus. Yeah, it could be a precarious time for them. Simone, thank you very much. Simone Foxman on the airline industry. Let's turn our attention to crypto. Uh, as I was saying, flying higher. Stocks related to the digital currency continuing to rally. Bitcoin top $65,000 for the first time since 2021. Katie Greifield is side by side with me. So it's uh, Coinbase flying higher. Yeah, big time. You take a look at Bitcoin, of course, today up 4%. Like you said, it's above that $65,000 mark. And as you would expect, that's really boosting stocks across the sector. You take a look at Coinbase, like you mentioned, that, of course, is a big cryptocurrency exchange. Shares currently up 4.5%, uh, actually outpacing Bitcoin, as are some of the other uh, names on this list. MicroStrategy, of course, owns about $10 billion worth of Bitcoin. Clearly, they're profiting today. The miners not doing as well at the moment. You have some of the big Bitcoin miners there, Marathon Digital and Riot Platforms, of course, up 1% to 2%. Of course, these are some stocks that have been looking at at some massive year-to-date gains. So it makes sense that maybe they're seeing a little bit of a pullback, not quite a pullback, but underperformance here. But this all ties back to Bitcoin. Like you said, it's above $65,000 per coin, getting very, very close to its all-time high, just below $69,000 a coin. That was hit in November 2021. And if you think back, that was a very specific, a very euphoric time in markets. And we're seeing a little bit of a repeat right now. That is... Great news for Bitcoin, and like you can see on this screen, it's great news for those crypto stocks as well. Absolutely flying higher. Uh, Katie, thank you very much. Uh, turn to tech. Apple, as I say, getting hit with a $2 billion antitrust fine from the EU. What's it over? Abusive app store practices. And indeed, Ed Ludlow joins me now. It's amazing what the EU have said, isn't it? A decade of abuse by Apple, and they've come in hard with a $2 billion fine. 
Yeah, two billion dollars, one point eight billion euros. It's actually the first antitrust fine that the EU has ever issued to Apple. And so it's notable for that fact, but also notable because uh, the expectation is that it, was, it would not be as big as this. And essentially, what Apple is also, uh, the EU is also ordering Apple to do is to stop telling other music streamers or preventing them from instructing their own users that they might get a, bit, a better deal outside of the Apple ecosystem. What the EU or the commission is presenting to Apple is that because of the policies on their, their platform, uh, consumers were not aware of a better deal somewhere else and therefore probably spent more money on, a, on a, a, a streaming service than they had to. Apple, of course, is going to appeal this decision and they argue the opposite, that there is no evidence, as far as Apple can tell, of any anti-competitive behaviour or that the consumer loses out. And, you know, in a relatively pointed statement, they talk about, ironically, in the name of competition, today's decision just cements the dominant position of a successful European company. They don't name that company, but, of course, it's in reference to Spotify. Spotify brought the original complaint that led to the investigation that led to today's fine. So I, I think we brace now for, for a long legal battle between Apple and the European Commission on this. The stock is down 1.8%. I'm also showing NVIDIA on the screen, man, it's up 3%, building on the 4% gain Friday, continuing to push fresh record highs. But uh, notable, it's now uh, leapfrog Saudi Aramco to be the world's third most valuable company on a dollar market cap basis. You know, we know the story around NVIDIA and the AI infrastructure build out that's happening. When I posted this on social media earlier, a lot of people said, how much further would Apple have to drop for NVIDIA to go into the number two spot? The answer about $700 billion worth of market cap. A lot going on in my world. Yeah, well, we're seeing a reshaping of, what, that MAG-7 to perhaps the, the, the famous five, but it looks as if Europe is digging in, isn't it? Marguerite uh, Vestager, the, she is uh, holding nothing back uh, in her battle against Apple. Ed, see you later. Now, Bank of America's Jared Woodard is remaining cautious on the road ahead. This is what he writes. Investors love expensive stocks, Fed-dependent bonds, and it's an odd time for a blind date, one that may come to naught if inflation reaccelerates. He joins us now, Jared. I love your humour uh, in this. We love expensive stocks, but of course we love expensive stocks predicated on the view that earnings can continue to grow. So what's not to love if the earnings road ahead of me remains strong? It's glad to be with you, Matt. It's a great question because, uh, as we've just seen from the last round of earnings results, there are quite a few uh, positive surprises. And uh, my colleagues across Bank of America have noted the, the, the strengths, especially in some of the largest names in the S&P 500. Uh, when you have accelerating earnings, uh, it, it, it covers many sins. And uh, that's exactly what you've seen in the index this year. It's why in a year that was supposed to be a year of the bond, a year in which deflation-friendly assets would, would rally as uh, prices cooled off and the Fed cut rates and so on. Instead, we've seen a very different story uh, to start 2024. So is the year of the bond off the books? I mean, I've got various people now talking about 4.5%, no rate cuts. Is the year of the bond dead? <laughs> Well, it was, this was, as I say, this was supposed to be their year when you had 4% yield or higher. We were at 5% last year on 10-year Treasury. Uh, many, many Fed cuts coming any day now, and uh, investors got ahead of themselves, I think, hoping for uh, a, a, a calendar year in which deflation-friendly assets would win. Instead, what have you seen? In fixed income, the big winners have been things like senior loans, floating rates, uh, preferreds. Treasuries, the TLT ETF, which we cover, is down more than 4% this year. It hasn't worked out at all, and I think that's all down to the persistence and the stickiness of the most uh, difficult-to-move parts of inflation in the U.S. economy, namely services. And this is where you drill in. You talk about super core inflation being stuck at around 3.9% for the past seven months. Therefore, you must have some sympathy for this building narrative that Powell will double down on giving himself an extension on, on when he can cut. Yeah, and I, my colleagues in, in, in economics here at Bank of America have, have said similar things, that uh, when you think about the risks, maybe the risks are now tilted pretty clearly toward the possibility that sticky inflation, a strong labor market, gives Fed governors plenty of time to make whatever decisions they want to make. There's no sense of urgency. When you look at super core inflation, services minus housing, stuck at almost 4% for the past seven months, and then in the latest release, actually accelerating 4.3% 
that doesn't look like a Fed that has accomplished the battle that it's been fighting over the past year or two. If anything, it gives more reason to think that cuts may be delayed, inflation may become to be more accepted than it was in the past two decades. All bad news for fixed income investors who are in the most uh, high quality, most rate sensitive, most inflation sensitive part of the fixed income market, which is unfortunately most fixed income investors. That's why in our prudent yield strategy, we focus on parts of fixed income that can avoid those risks. And, and in that prudent yield strategy, you, you know, I was talking about credit spreads a little bit earlier with my last two guests. I was talking about the differential between triple B to double B. I mean, they are so razor thin. So. Can you just stand up and justify the, the, the prudent yield strategy? Sure. The idea is you've got to take risk somewhere. Most investors you know, got a wake-up call in 2022, the realization that they were taking much more inflation risk, much more interest rate risk than they might have realized after two decades in which those weren't really serious risks that people cared about. We think they are worth caring about in a, in a world that's now much different for the next 20 years than the past 20 years. That means for us, credit risk is much more attractive. That means sectors of the fixed income market, like fallen angel corporate bonds, merging market debt, floating rate loans, even preferred uh, convertibles, high yield munis in a taxable account are incredibly attractive. Those are smaller parts of the market, but we, th we think they offer much better value for a long-term investor. Just contextualize the emerging market and bond and equity potential return for me. I'm a U.S. investor. Why would I want, I mean, I presume if I step out, I, I look at a hedge basis into EM, but what kind of return can I get on equity and bond in EM? Emerging market equities, you can get high single-digit returns fairly easily. In fact, maybe contrary to what we might assume, emerging market debt has outperformed historically uh, emerging market equities on both an absolute and risk-adjusted basis. It's been worthwhile uh, to be in the debt of these countries. I think it's particularly attractive now because so many emerging market countries have improved the quality of their balance sheets, adopted a more uh, sober fiscal position. They also have many of the same growth characteristics yep. that investors 50 years ago loved the United States for so much. Favorable demographics, high growth, improving productivity, adoption of new technology, all the same kinds of things that you look for in emerging market countries. We typically look at China as a separate investment decision, but the rest of EM has a lot of those strong long-term features with much better balance sheets today to support a debt burden. Jared, great context there on the EM trade. Uh, my guest this morning on All Things Markets. Coming up on the show, bad news for Biden in the polls as we head into Super Tuesday. I think Biden's people uh, will do what they did in 2020, which is to uh, get out the vote and not take any of those votes for granted. Never take the voter for granted. The details to come on Bloomberg. I think Biden's people uh, will do what they did in 2020, which is to uh, get out the vote and not take any of those votes for granted, number one. Uh, but no, I don't agree that it's uh, it's time for panic. Trump's weakness really comes down to, you know, his base is still there, but his base is by no means everything. What he really needs is he needs a party unifier, which he's not going to get, and he's get an independence, which he's also not going to get. So uh, there's very much a path still here for the president uh, if he wants to take it and, uh, and again, not take any of those votes for granted. A Biden-Trump rematch looking all but certain as we head into Super Tuesday. It's less than 24 hours. It is the single biggest primary day of the year with voters in 16 states hitting the polls. GOP candidate Nikki Haley picking up her first win in Washington, D.C. over the weekend, but still trails the former president, Donald Trump, by a wide margin. Amory Hordern uh, joins me now to discuss more. So what do you think Haley wants to achieve out of this Super Tuesday, Amory? What would success look like for her relative to the presumptive run by Trump? Well, she says she she always said she's going to stick it out through Super Tuesday. She's still bringing in, you know, some big donors have decided to park their funds, even though they personally do endorse her and would have loved to have seen a Haley ticket. She is still bringing in some of these funds. She can use it in the future. Uh, she hasn't said what she's going to do past Super Tuesday. 
what is interesting to look at for Super Tuesday, because it's not so super, it's very anticlimactic, given the sense that we know that it's going to be Trump, he's on course to dominate and win it. What will be interesting to see is how much of margins he's winning. Some of these primaries are open, some of them are closed in the open prima primaries. We did see Haley do well, a lot of independents, even maybe some who's individuals who would normally say they vote Democratic came in and supported her in an open primary. In a closed primary, you have to be a Republican um, voter, mm -hmm. and, and that's what your ID is, then potentially does she do worse? So it'll be just to see interesting on how steep is the climb for the for former President Trump in a general election when you look at some of the, the data we're going to get out of Super Tuesday. Post Super Tuesday, do you think it defines even more clearly where Trump will battleground this election based on the assumption that he is the candidate? In terms of the electorate, yeah. yes. Where does he need to go after? How much more work does he need to do with independent independence with women? But in terms of states, we know the battleground states. That would and be the, the seven swings. These are the seven swing states. And this is where, you know, the election will be won or lost for Biden or for Trump. State of the Union. I mean, maybe, you'll get, maybe we can get a little bit more enthusiastic about that, but can you qualify for me the, the, the kite flying around tax rises that Biden may, may float into the, in, into the spectrum? Well, you're going to hear a lot from the president. Some of this is going to be aspirational as well, what he would like to see, but this is really his pitch to the American people for another four years. And, you know, when you, when you look about, think about tax rises, I sometimes laugh, laugh because when the Democrats had control of the executive branch, the House and the Senate, they weren't even able to close the carried interest loophole and left a lot of the Trump era tax cuts in place. But a lot of this is also going to be the president trying to speak to different constituents within the Democratic Party. Do you think it still holds as much sway as it, as it, as it formerly did or in this Instagram communication process. They're trying to find their communication mode, and it's not in the State of the Union, Anne-Marie, in, in the speech. Well, the State of the Union is going to be important, I think, for more how the president delivers the message more than what the message is. And that is because over the weekend, poll after poll, the New York Times led in their New York Times Siena poll over the weekend about Biden's age. 61% say he is, quote, just too old to be president. So how he delivers this, if he comes out looking energetic, enthusiastic, that is going to mean more than a lot of voters, than potentially the details of some of his plans he has for the next four years if he was to remain in the White House. Okay, you won't get much sleep this week. That's Anne-Marie Hordern <laughs> uh, on all things political. You can see her every day on surveillance, 6 a.m. through 9 a.m. with the surveillance team. Coming up, uh, sector price action. Let's get across to Abigail Doolittle. How's it forming up, Abby? Well, we're looking at a small decline for the S&P 500. It's somewhat broad-based from a sector standpoint. The worst sector on the day, communication services really being dragged on by Alphabet. We also have real estate, energy, consumer discretionary, and others down by four tenths of one percent or more a few of the sectors to the upside not up more than half a percent but materials industrials financials and tech let's dig in just a little bit more because there's two big names of course that are dragging on the s p 500 this morning uh, that is uh, tesla on those lower shipments out of china the lowest in about a year that stock down about 4.2 percent and then apple well below its 200-day moving average, really diverging from the S&P 500 by nearly 20% over the last few months. Today, down 2.5%. We have Evercore ISI joining Goldman Sachs on the idea that it's off the conviction list. But there you can see the worst sector on the day, communication services. And that nicey fang index down about six-tenths of 1% being dragged on by some of those mega-cap tech names, Manus. Abby, thank you very much. Coming up, the market moving events that you'll be watching setting the agenda for the day and the week right here on Bloomberg. Reluctance to rally. That is the narrative on the Nasdaq and the S&P 500 this morning. Apple is down as Europe shows its real teeth on regulation. $2 billion fine. Uh, it will be appealed by Apple, but that is the drag this morning uh, across some of the technology sector. Let me set you up with your trading diary. This is what you need to watch for the week. Philly Fed President Patrick Harker speaks a little bit later this afternoon. Tomorrow, all eyes are, of course, on Super Tuesday. I will Haley come off there against the former President of the United States, Donald Trump. Chair Powell testifies on Capitol Hill on Wednesday and Thursday. 
Thursday night. It is President Biden delivering State of the Union address. And it will come down, as Amri just said, perhaps to more style over substance. Friday it is the jobs report. What are the wages in the United States of America? And what is the state of jobs? Any sign of a slowdown? The narrative across programming this morning on Bloomberg is a no-landing scenario, which has implications on the rates market. That was countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.